Transcribed. The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents The Little Lost Shepherd, starring Rory Calhoun, Kathy O'Donnell, and Gary Gray. Vivian Blaine is your hostess. <laughs> are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. I think we all know the idea behind family theater. It is simply that we believe a happy family is one of the greatest blessings that we can have. A happy family does things together, works, has fun, and prays together. Yes and praise together. For we also believe that just as nothing can take the place of the family, nothing can take the place of family prayer. For family prayer can help bring a family close together, can help keep that family together. The best time for the family prayer is right after dinner, while you are all at the table, even if it's only one little simple prayer. Pray every night, for a family that prays together stays together. Vivian Blaine returns following tonight's family theater story, The Little Lost Shepherd, starring Kathy O'Donnell, Rory Calhoun, and Gary Gray. Very court is now in session. You, Winifred Carver and Mitchell Carver, Jr., I've read this petition, and you are acquainted with the facts of the law as it applies to this case? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. This was the day I had waited for, a day that really started over a year ago. It was the kind of a spring day that makes you think of creel and pole and trout on a hook. So I canceled all my appointments. Besides, the lawyer has to keep up on his fishing. I was cutting across the fields adjacent to Father Ronaldo's acres, about a hundred yards from the stream when I first heard it. The most agonizing sobbing ever to rip out of a throat. It was a boy, a pitiful little boy, not more than seven or eight. What's the matter, son? You hurt? No. Well, here now, wait a minute. It can't be as bad as that. Go away. Leave me alone. Now, crying and running away never helps anything. I'm a lawyer, you know. I'm pretty good at fixing things up. You can't fix this. Nobody can. I'm not ever going back. Oh, are you one of Father Ronaldo's boys? Yes, but I'm not going back. I see. Well, maybe you do have a case. What do you say we sit down and talk about it? Nothing to say. He gave her away. She wasn't even two years old, but he gave her away. He gave my baby away. Now, now, don't <laughs> cry, son. Don't cry. There, now. Easy. I held this skinny little body against mine while he cried his heart out. It would have been cruel taking him back when he felt like that. So after he quieted down, we talked a while. And then I took him fishing with me. I'm glad you're back, Tommy. We were worried about you. I'm sorry, Father Ronaldo. I shouldn't have kept him so long, but... Well, there's something about sitting beside a trout stream that sort of dissolves one's trouble. <laughs> yes, I know, Mr. Garvey. Did you catch any talk? Too, Father. Mmm, big ones, too. We'll have them for supper. Take them into the kitchen, will you, Tom? Yes, Father. Thanks for taking him fishing. We don't get to do half what he'd like to do for the kids. Oh, I enjoyed it more than he did, probably. He's naturally pretty broken up about his sister being adopted. It wasn't his sister, Mr. Carver. But he said... I know. His baby. It's happened several times now. Poor Tommy wants so much to be a part of a real family, and he's not likely to. He's eight and not much to look at. 
But why was he so upset about the baby? Oh, I suppose the psychologist would say he's trying to create a family for himself, to compensate. Always it's the infants he attaches himself to, the babies. He watches over them, herds them like a little shepherd. He's the only child we have who came to us with no identity. No identity? He was abandoned in the church. We don't know who he is or where he came from. It was on St. Michael's Day, so we named him Thomas Christopher Michael. No identity. I knew then if I had known it before, I had to have him. Because, you see, I don't know who I am either. That is, not who I really am. Adopt an eight-year-old boy? But, darling, we haven't been married six months. I want my own children. I want a family of my own. So do I, Wynn, and we will have. But this is different. Look, Wynn, why don't you let me bring him home? I know you'll like him, and he'll love you. He needs someone so badly. Darling, I know how you feel about adoption, and I admire you for it, but well, why hasn't he been adopted before? There must be something wrong with the child. There's nothing so wrong that a little love and understanding couldn't fix. He's just like a boat adrift without sails. He's got to find a port. Couldn't we just help him? Why do we have to take him? Because he doesn't know who he is or where he came from. Oh. When don't you understand? He's me. Me. 30 years ago. I owe it to him. To a child you never saw until today. No. To a half-starved little waif wandering around in the alleys of Brussels in 1918. And to a red-headed yank who, after fighting a war, fought his way through barrels of red tape to take me home with him. Oh, Mitch, Mitch, it's not fair of you to bring up that kind of an argument. Your father was wonderful to you, but you have to admit he did take a chance. Sure, he took a chance. That's the kind of a man he was. I will not take this child, Mitch. I couldn't do it wholeheartedly. He'll always be an outsider. He'll always feel the difference between our children and himself. I'd only feel what we made him feel, and that's all. Maybe if he were younger... Well, I was almost eight when my father gave me a mother, and she was and still is the best mother anyone ever had. Or if we knew something about his parents, or what kind of people they were, what his background was. My father didn't ask if I were French or Belgian or German or... Well, that's different. He was just so I was three years old and hungry. I can't take him, Mitch. I can't. No, I... I guess you can't. I don't know why I even thought you could. Oh, you can afford the luxury of prejudice when you can trace your family tree back for generations. But my life started in an alley in Brussels. I don't know what I am, so I can't afford to hate anything or anybody. And I thank God for that. It was the first time we'd quarreled. We made it up, of course. We both said we were sorry, but that didn't wash it away. I didn't blame her. Her life had been so different from mine. She was used to guarantees like sterling on silver, but I couldn't get Tommy's face out of my mind, and I couldn't keep away from him either. Oh, hello, Mr. Carver. You're getting to be quite a steady visitor. <laughs> Don't get up, Father Ronaldo. Where's Tommy? Uh, taking him fishing again? Uh, yes, if it's all right with you. Uh, Tommy is getting quite attached to you. I know. And I wouldn't want him to get hurt. If you can't find a place for him in your life, it might be better if you didn't see him so much. I know, Father. I'm trying. Uh, trying to work it out. You see, Mrs. Carver is... Well... Yes. I'll work it out. Somehow. <laughs> Pull him in. Pull him in. Steady, boy. Easy. That's it. Here, here. Just a second. I'll take it. Say, she's a beauty. Gosh, that makes three this afternoon. You're going to be quite a fisherman. You know, this is fun. I feel kind of different when I'm with you. Well, how do you mean different, Tommy? It's kind of hard to explain, Mr. Carver, but... Why don't you call me Mitch? Well, did you ever lay on the grass like this and look up at those big white clouds? Sure, Tommy. Lots of times. And, and kind of wonder where they're going. And then you shut your eyes real tight like this until you can't see anymore. Only you can still see them on the inside of your eyes. <laughs> they call that daydreaming, Tommy. Is that wrong? No. 
Only sometimes daydreams are misleading. Mitch, have you got a boy? No. I... I haven't. Oh. I shut my eyes real tight then. But I could still see Tommy's face on the inside of my eyes. Yes. I'm coming right now, darling. Oh, something wonderful happened today. Oh. Uh, Wynn, this is Tommy. I brought him home. Oh, Mitch, I'll... Hello, Tommy. How do you do, Mrs. Carver? Would you like some milk, Tommy? Or, or some cookies? No, thank you, ma'am. Sure he'd like some cookies. Go out to the kitchen, Tommy, right through that door. And make yourself right at home. All right, Mitch, if you say so. You shouldn't have done it, not today. When I thought if you just saw him, you'd change your mind. Mitch, I'm going to have a baby. A baby? Darling, that's wonderful. Why, Tommy will be pleased as punch. Oh, Mitch. No, no, darling, don't cry. You feel all right? I feel miserable. Well, maybe you better lie down. How can you misunderstand me so completely? I don't want to adopt a child. I never did, and now, today. Can't you see how impossible it is now? You'll have to take him back, Mitch. He can't stay here. I can't take him back. Why can't you? Because I promised him. Well, explain to him that it isn't possible now. You don't understand when I promised him. I told you I didn't believe in adoption, and you brought him home anyway. I tell you I'm going to have a baby, and what do you say? Yippee, I'm going to be a father, or, or you've made me the happiest man in the world. No. You just say, Tom, you'll be tickled pink. Win, wait. Win, please. <laughs> I don't know if Tommy heard it out in the kitchen or not. But in the end, she said he could stay a while. She said she'd try, and she did try. She fixed up a nice room for him. She even helped him with his homework. She was everything to him. Everything, except a mother. Tommy, you better do your homework now. I could help you with the dishes. I can manage them. You sure make swell pudding. Why, thank you. If you wanted to sit down and knit something for the baby, I could wash the dishes. I promise I wouldn't break any. Tommy, it's 7.30. If you expect to get any homework done. Yes, Mrs. Garver. It went on like that. The boy trying too hard. And Wynn not hard enough. The situation was becoming more and more tense but there was one person who might be able to help me. So I went to see her. Mitch, I've been thinking about you all day. Hi, Mom. Well, how's that big family of yours coming along? Oh, fine. Wynn sends her love. How's she feeling? Great. Just great. All right, Mitch. What's troubling you? <laughs> I never can fool you, can I, Mom? It's the boy, isn't it? Yes, Mom. I don't know what I'm going to do Wynn fights it all the time. She won't let herself love Tommy. But you said she was trying. Oh, she tries in her way. I was so sure it would work out because it worked out for me. And you, Mom, you were wonderful. You loved me right from the beginning. Why can't Wynn be like you? Son, hmm? I never told anybody this before. Not even your father. I tell you now because it may help you to understand Wynn. Mitch, I... I didn't love you. Not in the beginning. Not at first. That took time. Oh, I never suspected. I never meant you to. Well, I guess that's that. There goes my balloon. Wait, Mitch. There's more to it than that. Have you ever wondered why people say you look like me? You don't, not really. But when people live in happiness a long time, something in them gets to be alike. Love does that, Mitch. I see. Come here, son. Your tie is crooked again. Thanks, Mom. For everything. I was more patient with Wynn after that, and I kept hoping. But I had a lot of problems on my mind, 
Wynn and the new baby and Tommy and those adoption papers. I hadn't been out to see Father Rinaldo in quite a while when I received his message. Uh, Mitch, uh, how does Mrs. Carver feel about Tommy now? Has the feeling changed? Oh, yes, it's much... No, not really. Mm. Perhaps you'd better send Tommy back to me. Oh, no, no, I I couldn't do that. It, it wouldn't be right. At a time like this, you must consider the happiness of your wife. Well, give me a little time, Father. I, I know it'll work out. It's got to. Remember, Mitch, you cannot break a family to make a family. The law gives you a trial period of one year. Eight and a half months have run through. I think it would be kinder to all concerned if Tommy were to come back now. I suppose you're right. Let me think about it for a few days. That night was alive with thoughts as I lay in bed, my eyes wide open in the dark. Are you awake, Mitch? Yes. I'm sorry about things. Oh, that's all right. I never wanted to let you down, Mitch. I honestly tried. I'm going to take him back tomorrow. Have you told him? No, I'll tell him in the morning. Oh, no, Mitch, let him stay. I'll try harder. I know what it means to you. And... That's not enough, man. He's got to mean the same to you, too. I'm sorry, Mitch. No, no, help! Honey! Help! terrible thing, a small boy's fright echoing in the dark. I dashed down the hall. He was sitting up in bed, the cover still drawn over his head. He was trembling so violently that the whole bed seemed to shake. I pulled the covers away, talking to him all the while, softly. I didn't want to startle him any worse. Gradually, I woke him out of the nightmare. No! No! Now, now, Tommy, it's all right. It's Mitch. Mitch? What was it, Tommy? What frightened you? Oh, Mitch, don't let them take me away. Take you away? Who, Tommy? All of them. They're going to take me away. I don't want to go. I told them, but they made me... No, 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 Tommy, relax. It was just a dream. Don't go away. I'll dream it again. Stay here with me, Mitch. Please, I'm afraid. Ah, you don't want ever to be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. You wouldn't let anything hurt me, would you? No. Not if I could help it. I don't know why I was such a scaredy cat dreaming like that. You wouldn't ever let them take me away, would you, Mitch? I turned away from the trust in those simple eyes and went back to bed. Poor little kid. I tried not to think about anything. I had an important case tomorrow. I couldn't afford to be distracted. Sheer force of habit must have put me to sleep, but I slept fitfully dreaming confused dreams. I woke with a headache. I was late. I rushed out the front door. Wynn and Tommy were upstairs. And I hadn't said a word to him about sending them back. Your pajamas, Tommy. Oh, I forgot. I'm Hang sorry. Them up. Yes, Mrs. Carver. I hung up with the towels in the bathroom. That's fine. And I cleaned me on my ears, my fingernails. I'll go down now and put up your lunch. Spread up your bed and then you hurry down. You'll be late for school. No, ma'am. I won't. Maybe you'd better let me carry that laundry downstairs for you. Never mind. Get ready for school. Tommy! <gasps> Mrs. Carver! Mrs. Carver! Mother! Oh, Mother, you're hurt! Trip on the top step. No, no. Don't you get scared. You lay still. Don't move. <laughs> Here. I'll get you a pillow off the couch. You're not supposed to move now. Don't try it one bit. Promise me. Please promise me you won't move. My... My back. You're going to be all right. Don't you worry. I'll go get the doctor. You're going to be all right, Mother. Honest you are. I was in court when the hospital called my office. It took quite a while to reach me. They said she'd fallen. That's all they said. And I was half crazy with worry by the time I got to the hospital. Tommy. Mitch. She fell down the stairs. I know. Where is she now? In there. The doctor took her in there. It's been a long time, Mitch. Why don't they come out? Now, don't worry, Tommy. I can't help it. She was crying. It hurt awful. 
We sat there, two people who loved her, and waited. That's all we could do. When the doctor came out of the door, I... I was afraid to ask him. She's all right, Mr. Carver. Both of you girls are all right. The fall didn't... Both of my girls? Yes. Six pounds, two ounces. And your wife's all right. Oh, she'll have to stay in bed a little longer than usual, maybe, but she'll be all right. You want to see her? Y yes, yes, I'd like to. Right in through that door. Mitch. Oh, when I was so afraid. He was wonderful to me. No, he's a good doctor. No, I meant Tommy. He was frightened, but he acted so grown up. He took care of me like I was calling in, Mitch. Tommy? Yes? Mrs. Carver wants to see you. Hello, Tommy. Are you all right? Yes, Tommy. Oh, gee, Mrs. Carver, I'm sure glad. Why did you call me? Mrs. Carver. That isn't what you called me after I fell down the stairs. Is it, Tommy? Uh, no. Do you remember what you called me? Mother! Tonight's story about a young man, a family, and love recalls one of the finest bits of inspiration I know, the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Think what it would mean if every one of us took this prayer to heart. A world at prayer is a world at peace. This is Vivian Blaine saying good night and God bless you. Our thanks to Rory Calhoun, Kathy O'Donnell, and Gary Gray for their performances this evening. Our thanks to John and Grant Bagney for writing tonight's play and to Max Tear for his music. This production of Family Theater Incorporated was directed by David Young. Tonight's cast included Pedro de Cordoba, Janet Scott, Norman Field, and Whitfield Connor. Next week, our family theater star will be Jimmy Durante in Mr. Carousel. Your hostess will be Jeanette McDonald. This series of the Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program and by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need. This feature was produced and transcribed earlier in Hollywood. Tony Lafrano speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.